Chris, um, tell us about that um, the project you've been in the background uh, coaching some guys in that sort of opening up fresh ways of communicating to and, and connecting with people with a Muslim background. Yeah, I think the, the project you're referring to is um, a website called kingdom.training. And it was started by a team focusing on some Arab Muslims specifically. And um, they didn't really have an internet ministry background, interestingly enough. But they were interested in multiplication movements and so they decided that they needed additional ways besides just the amount of on the ground, you know, personal evangelism to start to filter for persons of peace. And so they started getting into the media ministry. And um, as they looked around at sort of best practices and things like that, they found out really there weren't any that they could find that were aimed at creating disciples who multiply and planting churches that multiply. Most of them were geared for conversions, you know, to have mm -hmm. converts. And then they would seek to do some follow-up discipleship, but it was more aimed at feeding than at equipping them to feed and, you know, reach others and multiply disciples. So um, they started looking for ways to do that. And with some starts and stops, you know, as we all have when we're, we're learning something, they ended up falling into some approaches that seemed to be pretty effective. And they had multiple people speaking into that. Um, one unusual one is uh, someone who was uh, educated via the U.S. government. They got a Ph.D. in studying how uh, Muslim fundamentalists would use the Internet to not only recruit, but also to train and then to, you know, kind of multiply cells and so on. And so he happens to be a very serious believer. And so um, he was able to give them some helpful insights. And then they were receiving, of course, um, insights from multiplication, you know, practitioners, CPM, DMM practitioners. And um, so the result is now they have started coaching others who have media ministries uh, how to do this. So essentially, first they make sure they're up to speed on kind of CPM or DMM principles and kind of cast a vision for how internet can be used as an integral part of helping catalyze these movements. And um, then they give some special emphasis to extraordinary prayer, which is really where they started. That's where they had their first successes. And then the development of personas. So that, that would be the type of person that you are particularly aimed at. So that they, what they seek to do is find out from live, you know, evangelism, attempts what types of people are tending to come to faith and then crafting an entire you know approach based on that type of person's specific felt needs and then they started determining what over time what were the critical steps along the path uh, that were sequential, and then there are a bunch of steps that don't have to be sequential. They're non-sequential, so they can happen at any time. And then based on these, you know, sequential critical path items and the non-sequential ones, they're able to craft, you know, approaches through whatever the local social media, you know, platforms are and so on. 
And then a critical aspect is at some point, really, we're wanting this to connect with offline behavior and offline, you know, church and offline disciple making. And so there's a lot of emphasis put on how to make that connection from online to offline. And then they'll coach you through um, the best media platform for your situation and, you know, some sort of branding or marketing, coaching, development of content, development of targeted ads, and then setting up a really rigorous evaluation process so that um, you can, you know, find what's working and, and adjust what isn't and then, you know, kind of implement it. So they have an entire course online at that kingdom.training, which walks you through a series of lessons to learn this process. And also, even in the sort of pre-evangelism or evangelism, you know, parts of the process, they're trying to prepare people for these multiplicative behaviors, you know, for, you know, the idea that, um, you know, for example, that the Bible should impact how we live, even though they're not Christians, they're kind of predisposing them to have that attitude and that anything you learn spiritually, you really should be passing on to others and so on. And so they're sort of starting with the end in mind, you know, as they develop the entire approach to these, you know, pre-believer attempts. And so they're finding that the people that, that they're reaching with these targeted ads and then sort of preconditioning like this tend to be far more ready for those, inter those personal interactions from field workers because they're, in a sense, preconditioned and prepared for that to be a fruitful meeting. Okay. Now, in some settings, that could be a dangerous meeting because oh, yeah. how, how do you know if the person's genuine? Yeah, all through the Muslim world, that's true. Um, so, you know, that's another benefit, in a sense, is... Uh, you're, you're having a much more thorough screening, in a sense, mm. of the people that you're meeting with. Um, from what you understand, people are um, coming to Christ, they're learning to follow him, and discipleship and church formation is happening. Yes. And generational growth is happening. Okay. What else are you seeing out there in the field, Curtis, that you've just got your attention um as long as we're on the theme of uh online you know attempts um the zume project is finally starting to get translated into a few more languages um as as of this week <laughs> a couple more so and so um Right now, there's English, Farsi, Thai, and Spanish. And uh, I believe next week, Arabic should come online. And then if it's a couple of months till this airs, hopefully there'll be several more languages up. And there are 37 languages targeted. So Zume is uh, an online um, small group curriculum, essentially. It's um, introductory movement principles and practices. And so it's set up into two hour blocks. There are 10 two hour lessons. And um, during those lessons, the participants will um, view a video or two or three, each one, you know, maybe five minutes long. Um, they'll have discussion questions about that, and then they'll have practice time where they implement, you know, what they have just learned. They practice it. So, you know, one week they'll go out for a prayer walk. Uh, one week they'll have an accountability group. Um, two or three weeks they'll have, you know, the DBS or three-thirds group or T for T group or whatever you want to call it, you know. Um, 
and so on. And so that there's practice time, discussion time, and then some content. And so it walks them through this process over 10 sessions. Most people do it once a week. And then they develop a three month plan and they're hooked up with a live coach who can you know, answer any questions and so on. And then go out and implement. And so, um, you know, our early experience is all in English because that's all we had for that. And, um, but it's promising. So there's, there are a lot of people who are going through it. And then even people who have never led anyone to Christ or anything are going out, sharing their faith, winning people to Christ, starting groups and so on. Um, it's a little too early to see how much generational growth there will be from churches planted, but there's already multiple examples of multiple generations of these training groups starting. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's good potential for that. And the nice thing will be, it'll be available in 37 languages. So um, kind of the idea is it makes training more accessible to more people. You know, because you know, as a as a trainer, getting people together, having the time to attend training, it's you know hard to get them as much training as you want. And there's even you know even in languages like English or Hindi, where there are a lot of trainers, there's so many people that need to be trained. It's always a little bit of a limitation, you know, having good trainers and um so this in a sense helps filter for the people who are really serious about implementation and then those you know more experienced coaches and trainers can focus more of their attention on those people that have sort of you know self-filtered and um in a lot of these languages there aren't many good trainers available you know if you get out of the top four or five languages it starts getting thin pretty quickly in terms of uh, availability of good trainers. So. And where, where do people go to learn more about Zume? Yep, that's zumeproject.com. So that's Z or Z for you Brits and other, you know, uh, Commonwealth folks, Z-U-M-E project.com. Great. Okay. And so same pattern that you're finding um, in this case, uh, connecting with people who want to go and, and multiply, this has been a, a good way of taking that broad and then filtering. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it hasn't scaled yet because it hasn't really been promoted much at all. Um, actually, in some senses, the website's still under development. So we're kind of waiting until we, Think we've got most of our ducks in a row before promoting it much but already thousands of people have gone through the training and uh, you know a, a fairly high percentage of those are seeing some fruit so we're, we're encouraged yeah so it can't same with um, reaching Muslims it can't just stay online there's got to be a point at which it gets people out into their community face to face. And that happens right away with the Zoom because the people meeting for the training are meeting face to face. Mm -hmm. They're in groups of four to 12 people okay. and they actually go out into the neighborhoods practicing what they're learning. So, you know, that offline stuff happens during the training. So, mm -hmm. great. Well, are there any other trends or patterns that you're picking up just as you look across the globe and, and see what God's doing when it, when it comes to multiplying disciples and churches? Um, of course, uh, an exciting recent development is the 2414 Coalition. Hmm. So, you know, many streams that have common roots, you know, if you go back 20 years or whatever, um, but for a variety of very good reasons have developed, you know, different emphases and, you know, 
different flavors, as it were, um, are kind of coalescing into this coalition in order to seek to have multiplicative approaches used as broadly as possible. So specifically, the goal is to engage every people group in every place with a movement approach by the end of 2025. And specifically, we have 65,000 geographic targets and 65,000 people group targets that we're wanting to see engaged by that time. So um, obviously, that's an extremely aggressive goal. Yeah. Um, and we're not saying movements will actually be happening by then, but that someone will be using these multiplicative methods in every place, in every people group. And so to find out more information about that, you should go to 2414now.net. And if you go to the connect um, pull down menu, so 2414now.net slash connect, um, there's a little description of sort of what it means to be a part of 2414. And if you're interested in that, you can click you know, that you're making that commitment and then there'll be a f information form you can fill out and then you'll be connected with appropriate people within the network to sort of take your next step, depending, you know, on the nature of your interest. So that, that's not just for organizations then and mission agencies, it's for individuals who are saying. Absolutely. In fact, I, as you well know, most of the practitioners in the world aren't part of an organization that only does this type of approach. There may be, um, I'm thinking five or six agencies mm -hmm. where absolutely every person in the organization, that's all they, and that's only what they do, that's all they do. Those, those organizations are limited. But there are many organizations that have individuals within them, you know, that, pursue movements and our practitioners. So you, it's possible for an organization to join, but for the most part, it's a coalition of individual practitioners. Okay, and that's uh, 2414now.net. Now. Dot net. And that's um, bouncing off Matthew 2414. That's right. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So, yep. I'm just wondering if you have a story from a field somewhere that has really encouraged you recently, of where there's been a breakthrough. What's happened among um, Burmese Buddhists has been particularly encouraging because, you know, we've seen multiple big breakthroughs among Muslims, multiple big breakthroughs among Hindus, for sure. Multiple big breakthroughs among animists. Mm. Um, and now more and more in Christian background areas, you know, nominal Christian areas. But sort of the big chunk of people groups where the, in a sense, the, the big movements had been pretty scarce was among Buddhists. Um, and so that may be the biggest one among, you know, kind of real Buddhists, uh, which, you know, discounting some that might sort of claim to be Buddhists in China, but they're not in anywhere close really, you know? Um, so to me, that, that was kind of a big one because Buddhism, had continued to be somewhat of a tough nut. What, wait, what, what's taking place? Yeah, just, you know, huge numbers of believers, churches, lots of generational growth. And, um, you know, they're reaching other people groups, including, you know, even before all of the problems started with the Rohingya Muslims, uh, including them. So they reached large numbers of, you know, that people group even before all these problems started, which actually helped seed, you know, the diaspora from them. So, yeah, it's really encouraging. And are people 
indicating, um, you know, what, what have been the natural factors that have led to this breakthrough or is it just the mystery of a sovereign God? Um, I haven't talked to the primary leaders of, about that particular topic, but I could give some guesses that, mm. you know, um, but you know, the, the years of uh, repressive government and things like that and the, you know, resultant poverty, even in the midst of, you know, the part of the country up in the, toward the north where you're in the golden triangle and the, just awash with cash that is, uh, you know, pretty much controlled entirely by the drug lords and uh, the reg normal people, you know, still suffering from great deprivation. And uh, so, you know, as in many cases we've seen historically, when there's just a huge dissatisfaction with the status quo, you know, people seem to be more ripe for kind of these big movements. Mm. Are, are there any other hot spots that have um, been a pleasant surprise? Well, I, I don't know if this is from the Lord, but I think it might be, is um, I'm feeling prompted to talk a little about, bit about a disappointing spot. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we're all familiar with some amazing movements that have taken place in China. But, um, you know, over the past more than 10 years, um, there's been a really significant fragmenting of the major national house church networks and um, unfortunately a byproduct of that has been a, a lessening of coordination of work um, and specifically among some of the unreached and especially the unengaged people groups so whereas you know 12 years ago say it looked as if in very short order the all the unengaged groups in china would be addressed that the, these movement approaches would be you know efficiently spread and all of that none of that ended up happening because of the you know the severe fragmenting so um in some senses, I think China needs to come back on our collective radar a bit more. Now, obviously, work is far better off in the urban areas, for example, today than it was back then. So, you know, not everything has, you know, been negative, but a lot of the momentum that we thought was there um, didn't really end up pushing into the darkest corners you know to the edges so that's something that i've noticed lately yeah so there's a challenge then um for us to for people of outside of china to stay engaged with what's it going to take to reach those unreached people groups yeah i think there is still a role for the outsiders, which I didn't think would be necessary. You know, if you'd asked me that 12 years ago, I would have said, no, we can, we can put our attention elsewhere. But I think um, they do still need us uh, to some degree to, to finish or encourage them to finish that work. So. Curtis, um, how long have you been on this journey of pursuing multiplication movements? Um, specifically multiplication movements really since 1992, early 1992. Um, but kind of the focus on the, the no place left vision really starting in 1980. Um, I was a, at an all night prayer meeting and felt a very clear call to that and uh, started pursuing that and then got involved in the movement you know aspect in 92 out of sheer desperation so um 
I won't tell the whole story because it's kind of long, but the, the really short version is I was on the ground among an unengaged group that was just extremely unreached and realized that the best case scenario in terms of any type of ministry I'd ever heard of, you know, or seen would take hundreds of years for this people group to be reached and realized that uh, in multiplication approaches, it could be done in, you know, in my lifetime. And uh, so determined right then and there that everything I did from that day on would be focused on only things that could multiply disciples or churches. So uh, that's sort of when I really started the multiplication journey. Okay, that's uh, almost four decades ago. And as you look back, what, what have you learned about sustaining that commitment? over the long the long haul well, i think mainly it's a matter of you know staying in tune with god's heart um he certainly doesn't you know lessen his his uh intention and purpose and so you know i think mainly it's staying in tune with him and how how do you do that oh wow well it's um hopefully many of the things that um you know all practitioners equip every believer in you know so um the the self-feeding you know aspects so on that um i promote people being in accountability groups that each week are reading or listening to large quantities of scripture. And then each day picking a subset of that to, to focus on in terms of, you know, application, passing it on to others, you know, praying about it and so on, uh, as well as what happens in the, the, you know, house church, um, you know, application time, the, you know, prayer with fasting and trying to set aside large chunks of time for prayer, um, including listening prayer, you know, very intentionally, um, having regular accountability for just life issues as well as kind of multiplicative practices, um, with a, an accountability partner, um, weekly or close to weekly, um, prayer walking, just to keep seeking to grow and my ability to pray without ceasing, you know, which is really what you're seeking to do while you're prayer walking and, um, you know, continuing to condition myself to try to make that a constant, you know, attitude or habit or posture. Um, the you know body life aspects um all the one another's and and functioning you know on teams with people with varying gifts and um one thing i've been trying to not only for myself but uh, really focusing on um recently is preparation to um recognize and respond well to um, persecution and suffering for the sake of Christ. Um, I, I believe there's more in scripture about growing, God growing us through that than about how he does through prayer or scripture or body life or any other thing. There's more in scripture, but yet we tend to just look right over it. So, um, I recently did a series of blog posts on 40, which is not nearly all of them, but 40 passages that talk about that. And then um, I've put together a little short kind of self-guided persecution training. And it's more designed to help 
because where I'm living now is more designed to help Westerners, but it could be helpful for people in heavily persecuted areas too, but with very slight adaptation. So trying to um, learn, you know, every year to respond better to, to suffering the Lord does allow and um, capitalize on the benefits that he intends to bring through that. Um, I think another aspect is continually <clears throat> uh, seeking to see the world through two lenses. Um, you know, one being your ongoing relationships, your friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, classmates, and stewarding those relationships well. Either if they're non-believers, bringing them to love the Lord, and if they're already believers discipling them to be more fruitful and um, then the other lens being you know everywhere else with an emphasis on the darkest the most needy you know the least the last the lost um, and then trying to be intentional about keeping both parts you know both lenses active and um, so that I'm, you know, focusing on um, both further discipling those that I've already, you know, been working with and keeping a foot in the harvest, you know, because if you ever completely withdraw from one of those, no matter what your gift is, you, you will become ineffective over time. You know, you have to keep a foot in both worlds um, and we're called to do that now some people are called and gifted where they're putting more weight you know on one side than the other which is fine and more emphasis and all of that but we must never you know detach from either either world no matter what our calling or gifting is and I think that's important to maintaining focus over you know decades Right. 